The vast emptiness of the Australian outback is like nowhere else on Earth. This ancient scarred land has been pitted by meteorites, cracked open by ice age and earthquake, and eroded for millions of years by sun, wind and water. The striking contrasts of light, colour and shape give it a strange, mystical, primeval beauty. But it remains a harsh, brooding, lonely and unforgiving place where only the fittest survive. Minds and bodies are pushed to the limit, tortured in searing heat by day and then plunged into bitter cold at night. Here, a man can escape from all human civilization, but he can also be overwhelmed by solitude and perhaps even go mad from loneliness. This is the land the indigenous people call the Never Never. Inhabited, they say, by ancient and powerful spirits of good and evil. The story you're about to see culminates here at an outpost in the Kimberley Ranges. The vastness of this stunningly beautiful land is shattered by an explosion of violence when a crazed gunman embarks on a seemingly mindless campaign to hunt down and kill human prey. This is the story of the Kimberley Killer and madness deep in the Australian outback. It's early June across the top end of Australia. The wet season is over for another year, the roads are open and the area attracts tourists from around the world. The weather is just about perfect all the way from the northern tip of Western Australia, across and into the dramatic landscape of the Northern Territory. Spectacular rugged ranges rise to the north and east, while to the west lies the great sandy desert. This is a land rich with wildlife. Crocodiles roam its rivers. The waters are brimming with fish, especially the famed barramundi. The small Northern Territory township of Timber Creek is a mecca for fishermen seeking to land a few barra from the nearby Victoria River. It's 1987 and 70-year-old Marcus Bullen, a former deputy mayor of Fremantle, is holidaying in the Northern Territory with his wife Winifred, their 42-year-old son Lance and daughter-in-law Joan. They're now making their way home to Perth, Western Australia. Their return journey is leisurely, and the Bullens stop frequently to camp, fish, and generally enjoy the peace and beauty of the wild and unspoiled territory. On the 8th of June, they set up a camp and fish for a few barramundi along the Victoria River, blissfully unaware that a madman will soon shatter their peace. Driving alone towards them from the east at high speed, he's carrying an arsenal of high-powered weapons and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. He's come a long way, thousands of kilometres from Queensland, passing through the outback mining centre of Mount Isa before turning north to Darwin, then to the town of Catherine, the gateway to the Kimberley. Very soon, his world and that of the Bullens will collide in catastrophic circumstances as he comes closer and closer to the place he's decided will become a killing ground. Marcus Bullen, his wife Winifred, their son Lance and their daughter-in-law Joan are holidaying together in the Australian outback. They decide to set up camp on the banks of the Victoria River in the wilds of the Northern Territory, near the town of Timber Creek. The following day, Marcus and Lance set out to look for a suitable fishing spot telling their wives they'll be back to collect them. 
What the men don't know is that a killer is stalking the area, intent on murder. Police aren't exactly sure what happened next, but they think the killer might have been waiting for the Bullens here on the banks of the Victoria River, about nine kilometres from their campsite. It appears that as Marcus and Lance step out of their car, they're bailed up by the gunman. Get the hell down! Get the hell down now, I'll shoot! Hold it! Don't look at me! Turn around! Get down on your knees! Do not talk to me! Do not look at me! Are you listening? He's armed with a high-powered rifle. Get up! Back on your knees! Terrified, they follow his orders to lie face down in the dirt beside their car. Then, in an act of shocking and cold-blooded brutality, the two men are summarily executed, shot in the back. They die within seconds of each other. The killer strips his victim of their clothing. This is apparently a bizarre attempt to move all traces of their identity. He then drags their naked bodies a short distance away to the high water mark in the riverbed. Here, he quickly digs two shallow graves in the soft sand. One at a time, he buries his victims. Their clothes and the rest of their belongings are thrown into their car. Then, trying to destroy all other evidence of the crime, the madman drives the Bullen's car into nearby scrubland and sets the vehicle alight. Back at the Bullen's campsite, hours pass, and the husbands have not returned. Yeah, I thought they'd be back. It's getting a little late. They're catching a lot of fish. Yeah, I'm getting hungry by then. I'm starting to hungry. By now, the wives have become very worried and they alert the local police at Timber Creek, who immediately begin a search of all the popular fishing spots in the area. With the onset of darkness, however, the search for the Bullens is scaled down. Police seek to reassure Winifred and Joan Bullen that their husbands are okay. Their car might have broken down, and they'll find them safe and well the following morning. Privately, however, police hold grave fears for the missing pair. The Victoria River is a dangerous place, swarming with crocodiles. But they're not prepared for the shock of finding the men's burnt-out car adjacent to the river. Police conduct an extensive search of the surrounding area and soon discover two shallow graves containing the bodies of Marcus and Lance Bullen. Winifred and Joan Bullen are told the awful news as a major crime is declared. Police are mystified and struggle to piece together the events that preceded the murders. They seal off the area and soon discover that, despite the killer's feeble attempts to cover his tracks, there's plenty of physical evidence at the murder scene. Crime scene investigator John Horswell is part of a police team flown from Darwin. There were two large patches of uh, what appeared to be blood-stained areas and we tested those and they, they were positive to blood. So. In those areas, we believe that's where the deceased actually had died, and from there, leading to the graves, were drag marks. One particular footprint in the sand, which police believe was left by the killer, will later prove to be crucial evidence. Police also discover a .223 cartridge case. It's another vital clue. What do you think you're doing? Get down. On uh, this guy was pretty, pretty clean. He cleaned up after him, but he missed one thing. He dropped the cartridge case out of his pocket when he was dragging the two deceased bodies, and he didn't realise it. The bodies of both murder victims are taken away for a post-mortem examination. Meantime, the search for the Bullen's killer intensifies, and police call in even more resources. The Bullen's murder is big news across the top end. Marcus Bullen and his son Lance came here on Tuesday morning to find a good fishing spot planning to return to the motel to pick up their wives when they had. But when they didn't return that day, their wives became concerned and raised the alarm. 
police set up roadblocks around the area and bring in an Aboriginal tracker in an attempt to trace the gunman's movements. Police believe the evidence they've discovered at the murder scene holds vital clues as to how the Bullens were killed. The marks on the ground, the way the bloodstain patterns were, where the car had par been parked, um, all of that uh, indicated to us that uh, they'd la been laid on, laying on the ground when they were shot. Despite this, police remain baffled by the killer's motives. Was Marcus Bullen executed because of some previous event in his hometown? He was a prominent member of his community, but investigations back in Perth shed no light onto why anyone would want to kill him or his son. Although it appears to have been some sort of thrill killing, police are still hopeful it's an isolated event. Put your hands on your head, now! Go! But what happens next, hundreds of kilometres away in Western Australia, will lead police to believe that a serial killer is on the loose across the top end of Australia. Don't look at me! Don't talk to me! Turn around! Early in June 1987, Marcus Bullen and his son Lance are brutally murdered in the wilds of the Australian outback. The pair has been on a fishing and camping trip at Timber Creek in the Northern Territory when they're shot in the back by an unknown killer. Detectives have no idea why anyone would want to kill them. Police are used to investigating strange and bizarre incidents here in Australia's Northern Territory, but the murders of Marcus Bullen and his son are totally unexplained. And what worries investigators most is the manner in which their victims have been killed, leading them to believe that this might not be an isolated incident. A gun cartridge found at the scene is thought to have been dropped by the killer. It's from a high-powered .223 rifle. A post-mortem confirms the cartridge is the same calibre as those used to kill the Bullens. The murders are headline news across the top end. At this stage, police have no leads and they issue urgent bulletins for people to be on the lookout for suspicious vehicles traversing the area. Lovely quiet place that has been out here and then for something like this, you know, it affects everybody, it puts a bad taste in your mouth. The gunman, meanwhile, has eluded the police dragnet and is free to continue his trek westwards towards the Kimberleys. Across the border in Western Australia, 25 years old Julianne Warren, her partner, 26-year-old Philip Walkermeyer, and a friend, 36-year-old Terry Bolt, have set up a camp at an idyllic picnic spot on the banks of the Pentecost River, west of the town of Kununurra. It's a happy time for Philip and Julie. In just over a month, the couple are planning to attend a special ceremony in Kununurra to reaffirm their wedding vows with their families and friends present. They've heard media reports about the Bullen's murder, but they're not concerned. After all, the murders took place almost a week ago, a long way from their isolated campsite. Meanwhile, undetected, the killer crosses the border into Western Australia. The thrill of his last killings and his subsequent escape is wearing off. Raging deep inside is the need to kill again. At the Pentecost River campsite, Julianne Warren, Philip Walkermeyer and Terry Bolt are joined by two friends and spend the day fishing by the river. The following morning, their friends return to Kununurra. Further downstream, there are two other men fishing who also see the trio at the campsite. The fishermen, who leave the area shortly afterwards, spot a Toyota four-wheel drive parked nearby in a dry creek bed, but take little notice. From a vantage point on some high grounds nearby, 
The killer is watching and observes the others leaving the area. Dressed in army camouflage clothing, his heart's racing now and he knows the time when he can strike is near. As Philip, Julie and Terry begin to pack up their campsite, the killer edges closer and closer to them, using the long grass as cover. Yeah. Right, you want to get some sand in the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Let's see if you can catch yeah. I don't want any more fish. <laughs> well, shout us all a uh, chicken dinner when we get some <laughs> He makes a final check that no one else is in the area. And then he strikes. The bullets from the assault rifle slam into his victims in a deadly arc of fire. Julianne is hit first and falls to the ground. Philip and Terry Bolt are shot next, but manage to scramble away. Not fast enough, however. In seconds, the crazed gunman's upon them, and both are shot to death in a hail of bullets. No! 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 As the smoke from the gunfire clears, the killer takes a moment to savour his work. Then, once again, he strips his victims. He then rolls the bodies into the murky waters of the river, hoping that crocodiles will take care of the evidence. As with the murder of the Bullens just five days earlier, the victims' camping gear and clothes are placed in their vehicle. Again, he drives the car a short distance away, douses it in petrol, then sets it alight and leaves. At the Pentecost River near the murder scene, a truck driver sees thick black smoke coming from a fuel fire on the banks of the river. He thinks it's coming from a campsite away in the distance, but he can't work out what's burning. It's then that he spots a white vehicle leaving the picnic area behind him, and he moves over to let the driver pass. The truck he thinks at the time that it's all a bit odd, and he makes a mental note of the car. It's a small white Toyota four-wheel drive, similar to a forerunner with red flashes down the side. The car has Queensland plates and it's being driven by a small man. The truckie's observations will later prove to be crucial. When Philip, Julie and Troy fail to turn up for work the next morning, a concerned workmate drives out to the Pentecost River campsite to see what's happened. He finds the burnt out vehicle and alerts police who begin a search of the surrounding area. Late in the afternoon, the body of Julianne Warren is found floating face down in the water, some distance from the campsite. Police act swiftly and block all roads into and out of the area. We found a body. Meanwhile, back in Perth, here at the high security headquarters of the elite West Australian Police Tactical Response Group, a seven-man team is being rapidly assembled, gearing up for a mission to the area. The team doesn't know what to expect, so they pack for any contingency. The TRG officers have been told they'll be operating in a rural environment, and they gear up in camouflage clothing. They meticulously check the tactical radio communication and other equipment they'll need. Weapons and ammunition are also checked. They know they have to be prepared for anything. Each of the team members knows that this mission is extremely dangerous, but they're all highly trained and ready to deal with any situation. After their briefing, they leave for Perth Airport where a chartered jet is standing by to fly them to the Kimberleys. 
The TRG established their base camp at the Home Valley Station, outside of Kununurra. Inspector Bob Brown is a member of the team. The first team to arrive had gone to the crime scene, if you like, and they had discovered a further two bodies. Obviously, we had, there were shooting murders. We had three bodies, a female and two males. Obviously, we were dealing with a crazed gunman. James O'Kenny is the owner of the local newspaper that breaks the story. This fellow has obviously, uh, from a distance, shot them all in the back. Given the time to do it, they were probably totally unaware of what was going on, even the last person to get shot. All three victims are well known in Kununurra. Keith Wright is a local councillor. In a small town, everything's fairly open and friendly and, and everybody is inherently safe in a small town. And all of a sudden, things had happened that had changed that dramatically. People felt threatened, and I guess uh, more so the, uh, the, the children and the, the mums, but I think everybody felt threatened because there was so much uncertainty, they didn't know where this person was. It, it, it could be in the house next door. All victims are naked. They've all been shot in the back, and their car and clothes have been set alight. Police come to the conclusion that the Pentecost River murders bear a striking similarity to the deaths of the Bullens across the border to the east at Timber Creek. They now begin a detailed search of the whole area. We used metal detectors and located a, a number of spent cartridge cases from a 5.56 weapon. We also located footprints in mud which were to become very important uh, during the investigative phase. The Pentecost River murders send police in the Northern Territory and Western Australia into overdrive. It's clear they're linked and that a serial killer is at large. The gunman has a 24-hour start on them and police have no idea where or when he will strike next. By now, the murders are national news and media crews descend on the area. The population, the community, a close-knit community, was fairly traumatised already. And then to have this invasion of the media from down south, a very inquisitive, almost uh, abrasive uh, impact of, of the media, stopping people in the, in the street saying, what, and thrusting a microphone in their face saying, what do you think of this? Has this affected you? And obviously, it was affecting an awful lot of people. However, police realise the media attention will be crucial in alerting the public to the danger they face. They issue urgent bulletins on radio and TV, warning people to be on guard and to report any suspicious activity. As word spread, people went to caravan parks, hotels, and there was virtually nobody on the roads. Roadblocks are in place across the Kimberley. Motorists are stopped by police and warned not to travel into the area. Over the next several days uh, at Home Valley Station, uh, plans were put in place to search outlying um, station homesteads, abandoned buildings. One tactic the uh, group used was to put an aircraft in the air and search for dust plumes. By dust plume, I mean the dust put up by a vehicle travelling on a gravel road. As I said, most people were aware and most people had gone to caravan parks. The whole community was terrified. At the time, Diana Oliver runs the local ammunition store. We had a 12-gauge shotgun on the kitchen table with ammunition where we knew where to get it quickly. And Ian taught Annabelle and myself how to shoot to kill. This fellow was not like some of the people we'd had running around with guns threatening to shoot people before. Uh, this fellow was a sniper type person who hid in the bushes and shot you in the back and things like this. And that was pretty disturbing for everyone, the police, ourselves, anyone who had to move around to Kimberley at the time. There's a very real fear that the unknown killer could strike again and at any time. Back at the Pentecost River site, police find firm evidence that links the murders there 
with the shooting of the Bullens across the border. Detective Alan Bickford is brought in to oversee the police investigation at the murder scene. The same boot print was found at the Victoria River scene. And uh, so we, we were very eager to preserve all that footprint evidence. Now convinced they're dealing with a thrill killer, detectives begin making urgent inquiries with police agencies Australia-wide. In South Australia, police there, fearing the killer might be looking for a new hunting ground, set up more roadblocks along the border. Meanwhile, back at the Pentecost River site, northwest of Kununurra, police get their first lead. Investigators receive word of the fuel fire, seen earlier by the truck driver and his sighting of a Toyota 4Runner. The fire had been the victim's car. After murdering the three people, he had loaded equipment into their vehicle, driven it some distance back towards the main road, driven it off the track and then set fire to it. That was the fire that the truck driver had seen. Despite their first positive lead, police are still no closer to finding the killer and they hold their breath, wondering when and where the gunman might strike next. Investigators and frightened locals are hoping for a breakthrough and that breakthrough, when it comes, is nothing short of explosive. You look at the ground! Five innocent tourists have been murdered in separate locations, hundreds of kilometres apart, in the remote outback of Western Australia and the Northern Territory. Police have few clues and are well aware they're in a race against time. They're desperate to locate the driver of the white Toyota 4Runner seen by a truck driver at the Pentecost River crossing. The frightening part that everybody felt was the fact that to go from Timber Creek to the Pentecost, there was only one way. That person had to go through Kununurra. So they'd stopped at petrol stations. They'd stopped and probably had a hamburger. They'd stopped and probably chatted to somebody um, in a store. Um, and, and this was the frightening part. It just seemed that if he wanted to kill as many people as possible and then go himself, either die shooting it out with the police or whoever, or or shoot himself. I think everyone knew he was a desperado and, and it was frightening for many people. The awesome inaccessibility of this terrain underscores the magnitude of the police task. There's been plenty of rain here so the water holes are full and police admit with a few provisions the gunman could hole up in these hills for weeks. Then the breakthrough and when it comes it's breathtaking. Aware that a serial murderer is on the loose, Outback helicopter pilot Peter Lutenegger, like everyone across the north, is keeping an eye out for anything unusual. He's mustering horses at Fitzroy Crossing, which is 800 kilometres to the southwest of Kununurra. Not long after I'd started mustering, I noticed ahead of the area we were working there was something unusual in the bush. I'd... In any case, whether we're looking for a mad killer or anything, if there's something unusual, uh, you know, particularly when I was doing, doing something for, for, the, for the love of it, so time, time wasn't really the essence, so I'll go and ha have, have a look and see what this is. The bush pilot has good reason to be concerned, but what he sees is a camouflaged vehicle just a few kilometres from town, and he knows thousands of people are converging on Fitzroy Crossing for the annual rodeo. He passes the sighting on to the police. That information then came back uh, very quickly to uh, the officer in charge of the tactical team at Home Valley Station. We were then in, immediately, within a very short space of time, dispatched to Fitzroy Crossing Police Station um, in two aircraft, one belonging to the Northern Territory Police and one belonging to the WA Police. Peter Lutenegger describes the location of the camouflaged vehicle to the tactical response group. The vehicle is a white Toyota 4Runner, similar to the one seen by the truck driver at the Pentecost River five days earlier.
Inquiries reveal that a Toyota 4Runner has been hired by a 26-year-old German tourist, Joseph Schwab, two months earlier in Queensland. Police ask Peter Lutenegger to return to the area in their aircraft to pinpoint the location of the Toyota. They circulated over the top of that, uh, the uh, incident site, and they were able to identify an object, not immediately identified as a vehicle, but a camouflaged object that appeared to be a vehicle. They then returned to Fitzroy Crossing Police Station, and the team gathered once again, and a plan was developed. Having established the rules of engagement, police decide to move in. Tactical response group officers wearing flak jackets, camouflaged clothing and carrying high-powered sniper rifles converge on the area pointed out by Peter Lutenegger and begin setting up a perimeter. It's a very difficult situation in which the police must develop tactics that ensure their own safety, yet somehow not threaten the life of what could be just an innocent camper. Plans were developed uh, to approach this, this site, this vehicle. Uh, we weren't sure at that stage exactly what we were going to be confronted with. Uh, it could have been an innocent tourist uh, camping beside a, adjacent to a dam. Um, however, worst case scenario, we had developed some plans. After securing the area, they call in the police aircraft in an attempt to flush out anyone who might be hiding from them. We've located the vehicle, about 100 metres forward past our location. Send in the plane low, see if you can flush him out. Over. But what happens next is not what the officers expect. We then proceeded towards this vehicle. And after about... We'd identified the vehicle as about three kilometres in. After about one and a half kilometres, uh, we started to hear rifle fire, which was a concern and focused us very much on the task ahead. We had a police aircraft overhead, and that was providing us with some direction via radio communication. They were overflying the site. As it probably turns out, as it turns out, this individual was firing at the police aircraft. Back up! Back up! The police pilot desperately attempts to manoeuvre the aircraft to avoid being hit by rifle fire, still maintaining sight of the gunman and relaying instructions back to the approaching police on the ground. The officers are in the open. It's an extremely dangerous situation, and they dive for cover behind anthills and low trees that surround the area. I then actually saw the individual at the front of what appeared to be a vehicle. The person was wearing camouflage pants and was naked from the waist up. The police aircraft, which was out the back, had performed a low sweep. His reaction to this was to aim and fire at the aircraft. For whatever reason, he then looked to his left, put the weapon to his shoulder, and took aim through the telescopic sight. At that time, he let go around. Simultaneous to that, I fired a two-round burst from my weapon. The OAC of TRG, of that particular squad, called on him to stop firing, identified ourselves as police and said that two or three times. It's now that all hell breaks loose as the madman turns towards the shouting and opens fire on police. It was then that the instruction according to our orders was given to open fire. The IC called, he's shooting at us, open fire. Ed Trindle is another member of the police team. You've got bullets flying past you, you don't know where to put your head left, right, or duck up or lay down, because um, you don't know where you're going to put your head. Police then use a surprise tactic. They begin firing grenades made up of a combination of tear gas and fireworks. Pyrotechnic tear gas was designed to disorientate him, flush him out of his vehicle. It also had the effect of setting fire to the countryside. It was uh, a pretty spectacular sight at that stage, with uh, tear gas being fired in from specific weapons. 
and this individual being engaged. The gunman also has set up a series of ammunition stores around the perimeter of his camp. It's clear he's prepared himself for a last stand shootout with police. But his plan dissolves into confusion when the stockpiled ammunition begins to explode as it's enveloped by the spreading fire from the police grenades. Suddenly, the stock of the gunman's .308 rifle is shattered by the impact of a police bullet. His left thumb is severed by the bullet. Despite that, this individual went around, reached back into his vehicle and took out another weapon, probably more deadly. It's a um, Ruger Mini-14, .556 semi-automatic weapon with, I believe, either a 20 or 30 round magazine. Very capable of being fired with one hand. The fire had significantly taken hold. Mem all members of the team were now placing in covering fire, and he was very earnestly firing back at us. So far, none of the police assault team has been hit, but one officer, Ed Trindle, has a very close call. Yeah, yeah, I've got the um, a rounds through the um, through the sleeve. He's been in behind the um, shell dressing, had a shell dressing in our sleeves, on uh, our shoulders, and um, went in behind that. And um, yeah, it was very close. It was in, you know, tucked in behind a sand hill, uh, ant hill, I should say. And um, top of that went off, and um, we didn't realise I'd been you know, hit with a round until later on, someone pointed it out. But hmm, must go and buy a lot of that ticket. <laughs> Another worry for police is the possibility the gunman is holding hostages in the four-wheel drive, which is about to be engulfed in fire. In an act of incredible bravery, Bob Brown, under his colleagues covering gunfire, runs through the smoke and flames to the Toyota. The flames were starting to engulf the vehicle. I then got into the car through the passenger side, felt across and realised the keys were in the ignition. I put it in neutral and started the engine. Covered by my other two team members, I was then able to move across the vehicle, dumping my belt order as I did, engage gear and drive it out through the flames. There's no one else in the car. However, Bob Brown's action saves vital forensic evidence from being consumed by the fire. Just then, the armed man is seen running through the smoke and flames, still firing at police as he goes. One of the most vivid memories I have at this stage is the aircraft came back and uh, we're lying out the front uh, with other two members spread off to our left. But the aircraft came along and as it came across, you hear the clack, clack, clack of the left wingtip uh, striking trees. Suddenly, the shooting stops, but there's no sign of the gunman. Police, still stunned by what has happened, regroup and begin a cautious search of the area, which is still shrouded in smoke and thick with the acrid smell of gunfire. Then, the police pilot spots something from the air. The aircraft pilot and observer indicated that they had seen a person at the front of our group. Uh, he was lying face down. When police close in, they discover the gunman's body. He's been shot in the chest. He had sustained two bullet injuries from projectiles. Uh, one through the chest and the left thumb. He also received a shrapnel wound, I believe, to his buttocks. But it was obvious to us that he was dead. Meanwhile, back at Fitzroy Crossing, Peter Lutenager is at the Rodeo grounds when police arrive to tell him a man has been shot. At this stage, it's not clear he's dead. One of the police aides came down and got me and said, I, he's, the person has been shot. Well, I, I don't think he said who had been shot. Someone has been shot and we need you to fly the doctor out there. However, it's soon established that the doctor is not needed urgently. The gunman is dead, and it's obvious the man they've shot is the Kimberley killer. Dead. 
But who is he? And what was it that tipped him over the edge? Five innocent tourists are shot dead in a killer's rampage across the top end of Australia. Terrified residents arm themselves, fearing they could be the next victims. A huge police manhunt comes to a head when the gunman is killed by police after his camouflaged vehicle is spotted by a vigilant bush pilot. The entire area around the gunman's body is carefully preserved as a crime scene. The utmost thing in our minds was to find some shoes because he wasn't wearing them. So we had a look in the, brief look in the vehicle in the back and found uh, that the boots which appeared to match the prints at both scenes were in the back of the vehicle. Police also find bank books and camping gear which they identify as having belonged to the murder victims. The Toyota 4Runner is on record as having been rented two months earlier from Brisbane Airport by a 26-year-old German tourist named Joseph Schwab. But is Joseph Schwab really the Kimberley killer? Without a photo ID, it's possible the man who rented the car may be another of the killer's victims. It's not until a passport is found that they're finally sure. The passport photos portray an ordinary looking man. It's hard to believe the pictures are of the same person whose body lies face down in the dirt nearby. With the hunt for the Kimberley killer now over, the gunman killed in a fierce gun battle with police, there are still many missing pieces of the puzzle to put together. Who was Joseph Schwab? And what drove him to commit the atrocities that he did? It would take police many painstaking weeks of investigation to try to complete the picture. The body of Joseph Schwab is flown to Perth, where fingerprint experts formally identify him and a post-mortem is conducted. Meanwhile, with the gunman now dead, there is a collective sigh of relief across the top end. When he heard he was, he'd been killed, it was amazing elation and relief and the end of a terrible, terrible, terrible saga. At Fitzroy Crossing, Peter Lutenager is uncomfortable with his new status as hero of the manhunt. I didn't really feel that at all. I mean, as far as I was concerned, it was, um, it was good the job was done, but I didn't feel anything specific. I mean, these people were, these newspaper reporters were coming in and carrying on about, about heroes and stuff, and, and we just made a joke of it. It was, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it, it, it was fun, it was good. So that, that's, that's all it was, as far as I was concerned. Police also have time to reflect on the danger they faced and the courage shown by their team in the final shootout. Before every operation, you certainly become a little nervous. Uh, but training, confidence in yourself, confidence in your team members, overcomes that. Normal people wouldn't do this. They would turn around and walk off or run away. But we're not in a position to, uh, the TRG aren't. We're, we are sworn uh, to do the job we do. Uh, so turning tail and getting out of it is not an option. So yes, confidence in ourselves, confidence in our team, confidence in our equipment, confidence in our training, all played a part. And I've got, I've got no doubt, each and every one of us, when we started to hear the rifle fire uh, coming from the incident site, each and every one of us, evaluate how we were going to behave personally in the next 15 or 20 minutes. I certainly did, and as I said, everyone in that team can be proud of their actions on that day. Nobody took a backward step. This is something that really only happens in wartime. As funerals take place for his victims, police continue to put together a profile of the mysterious Schwab. It seems he arrived in Australia from Germany on a tourist visa just six weeks before the killings began. Came out here, hired the 
vehicles, bought the firearms, went hunting for animals and then shot five human beings for no reason at all. However, they can't establish whether the killing spree was planned or if there was some point somewhere in the wilds of the Australian outback when something took hold of his mind. Like other mass murderers before him, they find there is no discernible turning point. A quiet man one day becomes a raging killer the next. His background just didn't show up that this person who was always described as a reasonably quiet person who did mix and um, was just a normal guy. So what made him snap and suddenly decide to shoot people instead of buffalo and donkeys and things, I, your guess is as good as mine. Tragically, somebody was killed. Given what we were confronted with, that was probably going to be the only result, or the best result we could hope for. Uh, because he was very much determined to kill one of us. And if he hadn't have been stopped then, he would have killed other me members of the community. We have no doubt. The subsequent coronial investigation into Joseph Schwab's death found police had acted properly in their handling of the matter. Joseph Schwab's motives for his murderous spree died with him in a hail of police bullets. His bizarre habit of stripping his victims and burning their belongings and vehicles seems to have been more an act of anger than any sensible attempt at concealment of his crimes. We tracked him back to having been in Australia before. He's uh, through Interpol and the German consul. We found that he had lived in South Australia where he had uh, possessed firearms there, he used to go pig shooting and all that type of thing. So he was into firearms. And uh, I think he was in a gun club in Germany before that. Anyway, he went back to Germany and he became a security guard there wearing a uh, pistol on his belt and all that sort of thing. Officially, Schwab is on record as having killed five people, but police are still not sure if these were his only victims. Now, he may well have been involved in other matters that we are not aware of. Of course, we did other inquiries uh, throughout the country looking at missing persons, looking at campsites where we know that he's travelled. Uh, whilst we can't rule anything in, we can't rule anything out either, so it's a little bit of a suspicion hanging over whether he's involved in anything else. We may never be sure if those missing persons were also the madman's victims. It's part of the mystery of the Kimberley killer. For the people of Australia's top end, Joseph Schwab's reign of terror ended in 1987. But for the relatives of his victims, the pain of his murderous rampage will last forever. No!